All right, you want to lose uh, 30 pounds in 90 days. Yeah, I bet. Who doesn't? You uh, want to do it, and you want it to be extremely easy. Of course. I can do this. I can make this happen. I can even show you, but uh, the reality is you know you, and I have a feeling I know you too. But anyway, welcome to Walk Talk Vent. Let's do this. Hey, guys. Uh, welcome back. Check it out. I found your new favorite YouTuber. Meet Sarah the Diabetic. She's got a little rant, or as I like to call it, a little vent to do. And she's going to be talking about why she hates that she's fat. So listen up to what she has to say. You're going to love it. You're going to love it. <clears throat> Sorry. I know I look like complete shit right now, but that's not the point. Um, I actually was thinking... Um, so I've done a lot of crazy shit in my lifetime. All right, sir, I'm game. Tell me, what, what have you done that's so crazy? We want to know. Like, I drink so much to they throw up or... Now, is this back in the 90s? Are we talking Strawberry Hill like all the other girls? <sighs> Like, <laughs> sorry. Uh, I've been in hospital because I drank so much, like, when I was younger. Like, I've, I've done so much crazy shit in my lifetime. And looking back on all of that stupid shit now, I realize that... Um, it's actually made me who I am. Like, I'm very strong because of all the stupid shit I did. Like, one time in my life, um, I dated this guy who was homeless, and... Okay, be honest, nobody was expecting her to go there. I gotta hear this. Uh, it, I loved him a lot. He was treating me like a princess, like a queen, and... Do you think you could give us an example of how he treated you like a princess or a queen, Sarah? Uh, he asked me if uh, he could sleep with other women because... Um, I would not sleep with him enough to his liking because I'm not one to get down in the dirt outside. <laughs> so, I said, yeah. I said, do it. And I got so jealous. <clears throat> Sorry. And, and it was my own fault, you know? And it's so, so stupid. Like... Why didn't you just let him inside? Yeah, I was just thinking, because I was watching some YouTube videos, and I feel... I feel disgusted with myself, like... Excuse me. Like, just the way I look now, because I've gained so much weight this past summer, and it's absolutely driving me up the wall. But I refuse to do anything about it. But I need, I need to start doing something about it because the way I look is making me uncomfortable in all situations and I can barely leave my house because of it right now and I just, I feel so awfully ugly. I don't like the way I look at all. And... And I just, I feel so gross. Like, I feel so gross. I don't even, I feel so gross with myself. Like, I've never, ever been this big in my life. And just now, because I have nothing to do, doesn't mean that I can't still go outside and take a walk by myself. Like, where did my independence go to? I falls on a guy. Or my friends. I like, I have no independence because I feel that I can't go out and do these things by myself friggin' self because I feel like people are gonna judge me, but I don't I don't honestly I do not give a shit what anybody thinks about 
Sarah, why do you care so much? I'm going to be myself, whether or not you like me. So, I don't know why the hell my mental state is telling me that I can't go out and just take a walk by myself if I want to. It's kind of driving me insane, actually. Um, like, I took my hair down because I feel like I look awful with my hair up, but I want my friggin' hair up. Because is hot and hair up is nice and I haven't shaved my armpits in like a long time and I care why I don't know I don't know why I care what, what people think about me I don't care what people think about me <sighs> I used to be so much more independent than I am now and I don't know what the hell happened to it your mom and dad said get out I need to go out and take like 30 minute rest because like I'm getting, I weigh a lot right now. I've never weighed this much in my entire life and I refuse to stay this way. I cannot, uh, living my life hating the way I look. Like why don't I do something about it? In all God's honesty, I am going to go out and I'm going to lose the 20 pounds to get this all nice and tight because this is disgusting. I hate this. This, I could look like this in a month. If I stay this way, I don't want to look like this. I want to look like this. But at this current moment, I look like this and I don't feel like it. It's not because of the media. It's not because of what people think of me. If I drop 20 pounds and keep, like, I am not a small girl. I have some weight on me. But the thing is, I don't like this. This, the face fat, drives me bonkers. If I just lost enough weight to get rid of the face fat and some of my arms, I don't give a shit about the rest. Sarah, I'm going to be straight with you. Sometimes it's good just to vent. It's sometimes it's good just to get stuff out. Why don't you grab your shoes and we'll go for a walk, Sarah? What do you think of that? I really, really needed to vent that. And I'm so sorry. Oh, I'm so thankful for this YouTube channel. I know no one watches it or whatever, but I'm still so thankful that I can vent and at least have one person watch it. It makes me makes me feel like I'm not alone. But I really, I really shouldn't need this to get through my life. But you do. Thank God for walk, talk, vent, Sarah. Are you ready to get your shoes on and join me for a walk? Okay. Well, I'm going to go see if I can get a gym membership and not give a shit what anyone thinks of me. Maybe if I like tell myself once in the morning, I don't give a shit what people think of me. I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to drop the 20, 30 pounds that I want to and everything will be great. It'll be fine. Maybe that'll work for me. Okay. Okay. I'm done with this now. <laughs> Thank you to all who does watch, the, the five of you or whatever. Um, it means a lot to me that people um, are watching my videos. I don't know if you're interested in what I'm saying or whatever. It may not seem like we're interested, but we very much are. Listen, this is Sarah the Diabetics channel. Go and subscribe to her. She's got a lot of funny, cute little rants like this. I don't even know if she's doing this on purpose or if this is just her by nature. I think this is her natural self. That's why I thought it was so adorable. This video is quite old. I have no idea what she's doing now, but she's no longer a YouTuber. But I just thought this was so fun. But listen, this is how a lot of you girls were just 10 or 15 years ago with your Strawberry Hill addiction, right? So listen, put the Strawberry Hill down, put the ice cream down, go grab your shoes, let's go for a walk. Guys, sometimes I like to play videos that are kind of vintage and old on YouTube, and I like to do reactions to them. And a lot of times I think about what happened to my life over the last 15 or 20 years. All those experiences that we've gone through the past 15 or so years, they make us who we are today. They make us the person that we are when we walk through the neighborhood, when we show up at work, when we talk to family. 
it's, it's important that we go through this stuff. Today, I'm gonna share a story about me and my friends when I was growing up. And I hope you enjoy them. Welcome to Walk Talk Ben. All right, Sheila Allen, you put out the bait. I'll go ahead and bite. Some of you have said that, uh, well, specifically Sheila has said that uh, she wouldn't mind hearing a little bit about me and, and my story that whenever I do give you guys a little bit of my info, you guys find it interesting, or at least she does. So today I'm gonna tell you a story that we'll call No Best Man. When I was growing up, getting friends and keeping friends and stuff was just a, a natural thing for me. I had about four or five really, really close friends uh, as a kid slash teenager slash early adult. And I have fond memories of all of them, even though some of them kind of did me wrong. We'll see how you feel about it. So. So I had a, a good buddy in high school named Chris. And uh, Chris and I were super duper close. And I had another friend named Don. And Don and I were also super duper close. As a matter of fact, people called me and Don Beavis and Butthead. And we all worked together, we all went to school together, and then outside of work and school, we all hung out together, right? And Don had a girlfriend, and, uh, and I had a girlfriend, and even our girlfriends were friends, you know? So we're talking really close. And basically, in 1999, I uh, got engaged, and I was ready to get married to my first wife first and only wife, Liz, Elizabeth. She went by Liz. Here's an interesting thought. If an Elizabeth goes by Elizabeth or Beth, they're probably okay. If they go by Liz, they might be, <laughs> they might have a high horse, if you know what I mean. Not necessarily. If you go by Liz, I'm just playing. But for whatever reason, I asked Chris to be my best man. And Chris said, Excuse me, I keep saying his last name. I don't want to say his last name. So for whatever reason, <coughs> I decided to go with Chris as my best man. So I asked Chris, I said, hey, you're like a brother to me. I love you. I will love you forever. Will you be my best man? And he did not have a problem with my wife or anything. And he basically said, yeah, of course, I'd be honored, you know? And there's a lot of things that come with being a best man, as you know. You know, they're supposed to plan the bachelor party, the whole nine yards, right? And as we were getting closer and closer to my wedding date, I just go, hey, Chris, you know, how, how's everything going? Are you, are you looking to plan the bachelor party or, and this, that, and the other? And for whatever reason, he was dating this girl at the time let me backtrack. I lived in an apartment complex with my fiance. He, for whatever reason, moved into that same apartment complex with his girlfriend. And she would later become his fiance and they would later become married and I went to his wedding, okay? But it's really weird because in a perfect world, he would have been my best man, I would have been his best man, and that's just the way it would have went, but it didn't go that way. He tells me, of course, I'll be your best man. I'd be honored, right? As we get closer and closer to the wedding, I'm noticing there's no progress. There's no, it wasn't like a surprise bachelor party, right? So there was no, there was no progress on that, on that front and it was really starting to weird me out. And he lived in the same apartment complex yet once he started dating this girl, for whatever reason, he didn't want to hang out anymore. And don't get me wrong, I was in a relationship too, so our hanging out went from 24 seven, you know, every day hanging out with each other, to, you know, seeing each other sparingly 
and more sparingly as time went by. So anyway, we're about a month and a half out from my wedding, maybe even closer to a month. Keep in mind, this was 1999, so my memory on it's not as strong as it used to be. But basically, one day, he gives me a phone call, and he goes, Hey, um, I got your message that you left me, and I got to be honest with you, I'm just not up to this thing. I think that's how he described it, too. I'm not up to this thing. And I got to be honest with you guys, I had never in a million years heard of your best friend backing out of being your best man. I had just never heard of such a thing. I looked at it almost the equivalent of being left at the altar, you know, by, by a girl. I saw it like no different. He backed out on being my best man. And we're talking at this point, he was my best friend for like the last four or five years. I, I didn't understand it at all. We were literally friends since, you know, like our freshman year of high school. You know, all of a sudden, I'm uh, 23 years old. So we're talking, yeah, best friends for about seven or eight years. And he just backed out on me. And I know it wasn't his brain backing out on me. It had something to do with this girl that he was with, right? And, and, and I had always wondered, you know, like, hey, you moved into my complex, yet you never want to go swimming, you never want to hang out, you know? And I had always chopped it up to whenever somebody meets a, a new person, sometimes, you know, they can kind of drop everything for that for that person, right? So anyway, the good news is because I had so many good friends, I had a, 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 I had a secondary best friend. His name was Don. So I go up to Don and I go, hey, I want to talk to you about something. He goes, yeah, what's up? What's up? I go, you're not going to believe this. I go, but Chris ended up backing out on me. He goes, backing out on being your best man? I go, yes, backing out on being my best man. And I go, Don, my wedding's only a month and a half away. Would you do me the honors of being my best man? Because I don't even know if Chris is going to come to my wedding at this point. And I don't think he did. He didn't even end up coming to his best friend's wedding. Really odd. It's not like he lived in another state. He lived in my same apartment complex, right? So make a long story short. Don says, I won't let you down. A couple of days later, we go down to get our tuxedos and get everything set up, you know. And, um, and I'm sorry if I'm not really elaborate on this, but it was such like a bad memory going from having this idea of not only your best man, but your groomsmen, and all of a sudden your wedding's starting to get chopped down. Very, very awkward. And so I'm happy because I'm thinking, okay, even though it's not Chris, my first choice, it's Dawn, who is almost the equivalent of a first choice because where I had been best friends with Chris, Dawn was kind of that person we, hunt, we, we would always hang out with as well. So it was like a, another best friend. Anyway, what Dawn did might have been even worse than what Chris did. Check this out, guys we progressively get closer and closer to the wedding date, right? And again, I'm sitting there using my bachelor party as, as like a test in my head, like what the heck is going on? Because it wasn't a secret. I wasn't gonna have a surprise bachelor party, you know? I had my two best buddies. They were supposed to set this up, right? There was no communication going on. Because, you know, let's be honest, if you're going to do a bachelor party, one of the things you're going to be doing is starting to make contact with all of our friends to get the party going on, you know? I did not want to be that guy that was robbed of his bachelor party. Well, why is that, Jesse? Do you need to have girls rubbing on you? No, not necessarily. It's just the whole idea that you don't really want to be the one guy whose wedding is just weird. And if you start taking away bachelor parties and this, that, and the other, all of a sudden the wedding becomes kind of weird. 
So check this out. We go get fitted for tuxedos, get fitted for our, our formal wear of the wedding. Everything is great. The tuxedos, the, everything looks nice. I mean, we're literally getting measured up. And all of a sudden, Don lets me know. I mean, thank God he at least let me know. It wasn't like Chris where I had to kind of ask him about it, right? But he eventually lets me know that, hey, I know you're not going to like what I have to say, but my job wants me to move out to Cincinnati uh, to take a, a position in Cincinnati. He was managing a, a call center or something to that effect. And I go, I go, I go, you can't tell them that you have a wedding planned? Well, I could tell them, but I don't want to risk losing, you know, this is an important uh, it's an important situation. And I'm thinking to myself, if you can't tell your boss that your boy is getting married and that you're the best man, it's not like you have to ditch out on taking the position. You just let him know that you have to make a wedding date and then you'll go. I don't know one boss in the world, no matter how cruel or mean they are, I don't know of one boss in the world that wouldn't let you take a day off to get to get to go to your best friends or one of your best friends weddings especially if you're the best man so what I really saw it was is sabotage and that goes exactly to the video that you guys are watching today because you'll watch this video tomorrow on toxic friends guys there are some friends that are in your midst that don't necessarily like you as much as you think they like you. There are some people out there, as cruel as this sounds, that live for the idea of making other people's lives, you know, stressful. You're put in a pinch. You know, when you all of a sudden send out wedding invites to people, and all of a sudden you find out that your best friend's probably not even gonna show because he didn't wanna be your, your, your best man, right? And your second best man is now saying that he wants to ditch the state to go take a job. And by the way, I ended up finding out that he didn't even have to leave till a week after the wedding. So what's that tell you? You know, that means that he literally accepted the role, went down through the motions of getting fitted for tuxedos, and then he backed out anyway, knowing that he was already taking the place of a person that backed out before. So now all of a sudden, here I am, this guy with all these great friends, because, you know, when you're younger, you have more friends than as you get older, at least, at least in my case I did, right? And all of a sudden, I'm smacked with reality that, God, maybe I don't have any friends, you know? Because I always have great relationships with people I work, I had a friend named Wilder. And Wilder was one of these guys that I would sneak off and play rounds of golf with during work. We would literally go and play nine holes during the middle of the day. Boss didn't necessarily like it, but we were good at our job and we were allowed to do it. We were given the green light. And so I asked him literally with a week and a half left in my wedding, if he would go down, get fitted for a tuxedo and contemplate the idea of being my best man. And then I apologized to him because I had no idea that I would be in such a, a straight that I would need him, you know? But he did the most awesome thing in the world. He ended up coming to my wedding, was the best man. I ended up being one of the probably only guys in the country, or in the world for that matter, that did not get a bachelor party, you know? So, just a lot of weird things. That might have been a sign. Maybe I shouldn't have gotten married at all. Believe it or not, the day that I asked my wife to marry me, our dog died, <laughs> got hit by a car. And you won't believe it, he got hit by a Kentucky Fried Chicken delivery guy. I don't know if you guys remember, but there was one or two years in the 90s where KFC actually tried the delivery thing. And uh, my dog got away from us in an apartment complex and practically ran underneath a car to get run over. Looking back now, as goofy as this sounds, I would have probably looked at all this as a sign from above, Jesse, don't get married to this woman, you know? 
I married a person that was just kind of a mean-hearted person. I don't want to talk too, too much about my ex, but I'll just say that when I divorced my ex, it wasn't because another woman had come into the picture. I literally just discovered after a couple years with my wife that I had married just a mean person. But she wasn't mean from the get-go. It was just after time you just realize, oh my God, this person's literally a jerk. But this story is not about my ex. It's just about my friends or lack thereof. You know, I ended up losing both of those friendships literally at that time. So it's not like I lost a buddy because we got drunk and started throwing fists at each other, right? It's not like I lost a buddy because he hit on my wife or I hit on his girlfriend or something. No, nothing like that. I literally lost two best friends within the course of about a week and a half, two weeks, because they both just decided they wanted nothing to do with my wedding. I just thought that was really, really odd. And I could see if maybe my fiance at the time or my wife you know, was, was forging a wedge between us where we weren't allowed to hang out. But we were still very much allowed to hang out. If anything, this was Chris's girlfriend that was keeping him from hanging out with me. And then Don just had no excuse at all. I, I thought his excuse that he was taking a role in Cincinnati was just lame, especially when you find out that he didn't have to leave till a week after the wedding. It was just like, what a lame excuse that shouldn't even be used. No wonder he couldn't ask his boss if he could attend the wedding. Because the boss, it, it wasn't even, he wasn't even supposed to move till after the wedding. So it was just like, okay. You know, so some people might look at me and think, God, you know, you smile and laugh and you make us feel inspired and you're so uh, fun to watch, right? But the reality is you might be best friends with somebody that's more of a friend of me and not even know it. And that's basically the, the situation that I was in. If you're, a, if you're a person that keeps your significant other from hanging out with their friends and would urge a significant other to ditch out on being the best man at a friend's wedding, shame on you. Don't do those things. Those things are horrible. And for whatever reason, I think that's ultimately what happened to Chris. I think he was mesmerized by this girl he was dating. And for whatever reason, maybe she didn't like me. And the signs are there because like I said, he lived in the apartment complex with me, but wouldn't visit. I don't necessarily like talking about these things because these are things that, you know, sometimes it's better off just to leave things in the past. But it's weird because occasionally Chris and his dad will reach out to me on Facebook. Hey, what's going on, old buddy? And, you know, I just don't think you can old buddy me anymore because I just know the truth that when it came down to some important things in my life, they both just like weren't there. They both just took off. And Don, what made Don's situation so weird is he was always one of these people that talked about decency and doing the right thing and how can certain people do these certain things. And then, you know, when it came down to, to being a good buddy for me, those rules just went out the window. If you've had any world-class frenemies, please let me know in the, comp in the comments because I would definitely like to know that I'm not the only one with friends like this. You know, the old saying, if you have with friends like mine, who needs enemies? God, I, I just can't believe you how shocked I am about how things turned out in this world, you know? That's kind of why I tell people with walking, you don't need partners because if you rely on partners, they are going to let you down. It might not be today, it might not be tomorrow, but one of these days they're gonna let you down and when they let you down, you're gonna have a choice. Do I work out without them or do I just wait till they're back working out with me? And that's where they got you because if you stop working out and they never come back, you might never get back to working out. Okay, so when it comes to your walk, dive into your think tank. Just know that there's always going to be people that let you down in the world. And I definitely don't look at Don and think I hate him. But at the same time, I know I'm never going to put those people in the good or best friend category again. I don't know if I'm going to put anybody in the good or best category again. You know, you have friends, 
but don't expect miracles out of them. And if you have a friend that's always there through thick and thin, you are so blessed. You should call that friend today and take them out to lunch because it really is special if you have a friend like that. Now, there's two more friends in this equation. And what we can do is over the next coming weeks, we can talk a little bit about various friends, but I want to backtrack a little to who my best friends were in the grade school times because those people have houses in this neighborhood still. Well, the houses are still here, they're gone. But occasionally I walk by their houses and it's really weird how the brain works. There is not one time, and I mean not one time, where I haven't walked by their house and thought of them, you know? So it's really true that sometimes there's some markers in the world or in the city we live in that just remind us of things permanently. And so when I walk by my buddy Jeff or my buddy Jason's house, I just think of really good times. We had some great times. But here's the interesting thing. When you're friends with somebody as a grade schooler, right? You're not necessarily friends with them as an adult. People grow up, people move away, you lose contact, right? And Jeff, Jeff, one of my best friends ever, is my best friend from like fifth and sixth grade. So in my mind, I don't think of adult Jeff, you know, out there with raising his family and stuff. I don't look at that and say, that's my best friend. I look at that 10, 11, 12 year old kid that I literally walked the neighborhoods with, snuck out of my house at two in the morning to just walk the neighborhoods in the dark, right? I look at him as my childhood best friend. As an adult, Jeff has, has, has really taken to drug addictions and mental illness. And the mental illness is fed by the drug addictions and even when he's not on the drugs i think the drugs have left a, a permanent mark where it's almost like he's got it's almost like he's got medical schizophrenia he's one of those guys that you talk to him and before you know it you're having a really bizarre conversation and again because i never had an adult relationship with him i was only best friends with him as 10 and 11 year olds i don't look at it as in you know, I'm friends with this adult weirdo. And I hate to say the word weirdo because again, when you're dealing with drug addicts and you're dealing with mental illness, you shouldn't use terms like weirdo, but we're talking, this guy will call my phone to this day at two or three in the morning, nonstop, to the point where I have to turn off my ringer, right? And when you do answer, it's just, it's the babblings of a madman, right? And when you try to explain to somebody that, you know, hey, you were my best friend when we were 10, but I'm in my, you know, 40s now, you know, stop calling me at three in the morning. You know, it's just a really weird scenario. So I don't know if any of you guys have dealt with mental illness or if you have friends and family members that have dealt with mental illness, but my friend did not have mental illness when we were 10, 11, and 12. So when you're talking to a 10, 11, and 12 year old and you're a 10, 11, and 12 year old as well, you know, you're talking about PG things. We weren't talking about sex and we weren't talking about drugs and alcohol. We, we weren't at that level. We were kids. But I always felt like he figured since we were best friends at age 10 that we're like, you know, best friends forever. And there's a piece of me that if you were to ask me, who's your best friend forever, I would say, Jeff. But I'm still thinking him as a 10, 11, 12 year old kid. You know, I didn't need the pressure of being a friend forever with somebody that we had gone 30 years without talking. You know, imagine going from age 10 to age 40 without talking and all of a sudden you're reintroduced through Facebook and then you find out that your 10, 11, 12 year old best buddy is just not all there anymore. It was just really, really difficult to, to have any type of normal conversation with them. And if you've ever talked to somebody that's maybe off their medicine or maybe on a drug-induced wild man rage, you don't want to talk to those people for very long, you know? Any type of person that's a little off their, 
off their medicine or a little off their rocker, as we would say, it's really hard to want to have a conversation with folks like that, you know? My other good friend from elementary, Jason Hensley, three or four years ago, I look on Facebook and his wife, Triona, she says, hey, please pray for my husband. He's in the hospital. He's having some really hard times with his kidney and liver and blah, blah, blah. And it was because he was a, uh, he was a lifelong alcoholic. He was the kid that when we were 11 and 12 years old, he would uh, start grabbing cigarette butts off the ground and start smoking them. And I just thought it was really gross and really repulsive, but he was one of these guys that when he first tasted nicotine on his lips from a cigarette, he loved it instantly. So all of a sudden, my buddy that you know went to Boy Scouts and was just this all-American kid, all of a sudden, by age 11 or 12, hi, he had this like raging cigarette addiction. Just an absolute cigarette addiction at age 12. Very, very sad, right? But that's not where the story ends. Fast forward, because just like Jeff, he and I had lost contact. We were friends until we were 17 or 18, but then he and his family moved to Nevada, which is probably not the best place for a person with addictions to move to, right? Las Vegas, Nevada. He actually moved to a town called Basic, and he used to tell me this joke that he always thought was really funny. He goes, I go to Basic High School on Basic Road in Basic, Nevada, and it's your basic hole-in-the-wall town, right? So that was his little basic joke, right? But I always thought it was fun because that is kind of a basic name for a town to have, right? So anyway, as we reconnected as adults, because I, uh, I took part in the World Series of Poker in 06 and 07, and I actually made the money, so if you ever Google my name in World Series of Poker, I'm in the history books. But anyway, make a long story short, he developed a really bad problem with alcohol. Drinking was something that for him, he didn't just stop at four, five, six beers and a buzz. He would drink probably, I'm just guessing, a dozen, 13, 14 beers over the course of a couple of hours to the point where his skin was permanently red. Have you, ever, uh, have you ever met an alcoholic like that where just like their skin started looking really almost, you know, red and, 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 and inflamed? Lobster red. Anyway, a couple years back, when I see this Facebook post, I call his brother Trevor, who was very, I was very close to his brother Trevor too. His brother Trevor is still alive and I consider him my brother and I still talk to him on Facebook. He's a, he's a borderline professional fisherman. So I always joke that he's sticking weights in the fish's mouth, you know, because that, that was a scandal a couple years back. If you remember fishermen stuffing little round weights into the stomach and gullet of their, of the fish, Put that in the comments if you remember that. Anyway, I spoke to his brother, Trevor, and Trevor goes, Jesse, you have no idea how bad Jason's life is, whether it's drugs, whether it's pills, whether it's drinking, he's in a bad spot. And it was shocking to me because again, when you lose contact with somebody for 15, 20, 10 years, you know, it's not like you can call them and say, what the hell are you doing? Stop it, knock it off, you know? So all of a sudden, I'm making a call to my friend, but all of a sudden, we're, you know, 42, 43-year-old men, you know? So it's not like I felt like I had a right to say, what the hell are you doing, bub? You know, I didn't really, I wasn't as close to him as an adult, right? But I got him on the phone and I said, Jace, Trevor's telling me that you're in and out of the hospital and you know, you're overdosing on certain medications and pills, and they, they, were never, they never told me directly, so I don't know if he was taking Oxycontin or some sort of pill, or if it was just his drinking was getting out of control or what. But keep in mind, this was when the pandemic was such where every emergency room had, you know, had problems with getting people in in a timely manner because the ERs were all filled with, with COVID patients, right? And I spoke to him and I said, hey, your brother told me 
that you've been really partying hard. That's that's the way I, that's what I call somebody that's having an alcohol or, or drug type situation. I use the word partying. I think it's a PC term, right? I go, Jace, your brother tells me you're partying and I love you like crazy. I don't want to see you hurt. He's telling me that you're in and out of the hospital. What's going on? And he goes, man, I don't know why Trevor told you that. I'm fine. And I should have thought to myself, that's a little odd, right? But I didn't. I thought that's great news. Maybe Trevor was just over-exaggerating because at this point, Trevor still lived in Nevada, but my buddy Jason lived up in Idaho, okay? Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, really nice part of Idaho from what I understand. And we had even talked about me flying or taking a train ride up there to visit him. I mean, that was literally on the radar of plans for us. Anyway, he tells me that, yeah, he drinks and smokes cigarettes and stuff, but because of his job, he gets drug tested and he doesn't really know what Trevor's talking about, right? And he goes, just don't listen to him. I'm fine. Yes, I did have to go to the hospital, but it's just because of health issues. It wasn't necessarily because I overdosed or anything, you know? And so I felt relieved. And I spoke to him when I was right there at that corner. And it was, it was you know, a handful of years ago. Literally, a week and a half later, I look on Facebook. And I saw the in loving memory of Jason Lee Hensley. I'll say his name because he's no longer with us. Jason Hensley never did anything wrong by me. And don't get me wrong, we were kids. He never had an opportunity as an adult, right? But that's neither here nor there. I don't think he would have. It wasn't really in his nature to do bad by anybody. And to know I had spoken to him a couple weeks before he passed, and he, made, he, he literally deceived me. He told me that there was no problem at all. And when his wife put up the picture of him on his last couple days, the guy looked like an inflated balloon. He was so puffy. His arms looked literally like the Michelin man. And I don't mean like, oh, he's overweight. I mean, there was something bizarre about how inflamed his whole body was. To make matters worse, they couldn't get an ER for him. They were literally flying him from hospital to hospital up in Idaho because all of the COVID patients had taken up all of the rooms in the ERs, which just blew me away because it's like, God, it sounds to me like my buddy Jason died of a condition where he should have died in another country, but not the U.S. of A. How do you die of a condition when you get to the hospital and they could have saved you, but oh, our ER is full. We'll get you on a, we'll get you on a chopper flight to another hospital in another town or city. That just seems like something you deal with in the second or third world. So all of a sudden, over the course of a handful of years, Jason had moved to Nevada. Jeff had moved to North Carolina, in case you're wondering how we kind of lost touch, right? He moved with his family at a I, I think during the freshman year of high school, he moved to North Carolina. And then, like I said, something happened to him as a young adult, an adult where I don't know if it was drug and alcohol induced, but he basically lost his, his mind, so to speak. So if you were to ask me, do you still communicate with Jeff? Yeah, he tries to reach out to me all the time, but every time he does, he says really gnarly, nasty things to the point where it's just really hard to want to talk with a guy like that, you know? So I had two best friends that ditched out on being the best man at my wedding. Hi, how are you? So two best friends ditch out on me on being my best man at my wedding. And from that point on, our relationship was very, very sour with both those people. Didn't really talk to them, right? We would have been willing to forgive them, but they literally went on, you know, we're not friends anymore. <sighs> Lost my one friend to mental illness, right? And then a couple years back, I literally lost uh, one of my remaining good friends, Jason, to, to death. Which is another shocking thing that happens as you reach your 30s, 40s, and 50s is 
when I was, uh, let's say, in my 20s and younger, I hadn't really experienced death except for a couple of great-grandparents. But now, at this point in my life, I have lost so many friends and family to the point where I have more people on the other side than I do on this side, you know? And that's a tough deal, but a lot of us deal with that. If you've dealt with a lot of loss in your life, let me know in the comments, you know? I, um, yeah, so I, I, I kind of lost all four of my friends within X amount of years. And there is no recovering with Jeff. Um, his, his mental illness and his addiction problems and the words that come out of his mouth, they just get worse and worse every year. And uh, I blocked him, but when you block somebody, you can still scroll down and kind of see the messages that they leave. Oh my God, these messages are like FBI type messages where it's like, my God, this guy's threatening to kill me and everything. But I don't think he really, really means it. I think it's just the ravings of a, of a guy that's not all there. Because even when he talks, it's like broken up sentences and he's, he's typing with his finger, you know, he's texting these weird things and... He's just not all there. So the reason I bring this up is not to correlate to your walks or anything, but the reason I did bring up to toxic friendship is sometimes those toxic friends can cause you to ditch your walk and go hang out with them and they're very narcissistic at times, right? My buddies were never really narcissistic. It wasn't like a, you know, hey, come do this with me or else type situation with them. Um, they just decided at one point in their life, I guess, that they just didn't really want to be friends with me anymore. And that happens. You know, it happens. And sometimes you have to just understand that somebody doesn't want to be your spouse, or somebody doesn't want to be your significant other anymore, or someone might not be your friend. They might be moving in the frenemy zone, or they might just become an actual enemy. Should you forgive and love your enemies? Of course, right? Just because somebody treats you poorly doesn't mean you have to join in and treat them poorly as well. But everything that we go through psychologically and all the experiences that we've gone through, just like all the foods that we eat, all the experiences that you've gone through equate to what you are as a person. Do you trust people? Why do you trust people? Did you have situations where your best friend growing up is still your best friend? If so, you might have no problem with trust issues. But if you're a person like me, where all of a sudden all the people around you one year are no longer with you the following year, it could be very easy to, to lose trust with people and to, and to keep yourself close, right? Keep it close to the vest and not really let people in on your life. For me nowadays, it's actually easier to tell my subscribers more about my life than it is a friend. Because I've already got the experience of knowing that a friend one year could, could possibly not even be a friend the next year, which is a horrible thing. If you tell your friend you're gonna be a best man at his wedding, do it. If any of my best friends would have said, Jesse, I don't like public speaking. I'm just not up to it. You know, is there any way you could go with someone else? I would still like to attend the wedding. Then I would, I would not be telling you this story today. But I just want to let you know, people sometimes, many times, let us down. Sometimes you have to learn, even if it's only temporarily, to be an army of one. So again, I plead with you, if you want to get your daughter or your friend or your neighbor to walk with you, that's great. But sometimes you need to be able to say, hey, I don't care if they're not there. I don't care if Jesse doesn't do a video today. I'm going to keep walking. Keep walking. Fight the good fight. Give people chances in life. If any of those friends were to call me and say, you know what? I had a reflective moment. I did you wrong. You probably have forgotten about it, Jesse. But I still want to call and let you know. I should have never done that to you. Forgive me. I would forgive them like that. So here's my question to you. You have a 20 year old that ruined your life when you were younger. He got you pregnant or maybe she was pregnant with your baby and they ended up ditching you for a friend or an enemy or just for a stranger, right? 
and they ended up creating their life without you. Are you going to hold that against somebody that was basically a kid? Because if you're my age, you're 47, you're going to look back at the 20 year old version of you and you're going to have to say that was a kid, right? We are kids until we're probably 25 or 26 if you really think about it, right? What would you do? Would you forgive that person or are you still going to think of them in this horrible light and never forgive them? You don't have to be best buds and best friends with people forever, right? But don't hold that heart. Forgive. You got to move on. I have to assume that those are things that if they were in their 30s and 40s, they would have never done. Because as we get older, certain friends and frenemies will do things to us. And we tell ourselves, how could that, how could I do, how could anybody ever do that to a person? Yet when we look back in our 20s and our teens, sometimes we do things to people that makes no sense. So again, I forgive all of my friends, including Jeff, because Jeff has mental illness and sometimes people with mental illness say things that are really, really out there, okay? But um, I just wanna let you know that I wish you a happy, happy day and uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Enjoy your walk.